Philip Gust. I'm a treasurer of the Silicon Valley chapter of SLA, and I'm also a member of the IT division. We're going to be talking about cloud computing for libraries and digital curators. And first of all, I would also like to uh, echo uh, the welcome to our sponsors, uh, CRC Press and Springer. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I'd like to give a big welcome to Gilead Sciences for hosting this conference in this beautiful space and for setting up the food. Spectacular. And finally, I would like to thank the event organizers personally, the SLA I2 Division Virtual Events Committee, and the SLA Silicon Valley Chapters Program and Hospitality Committees. All right. This is what I'm going to be talking about today. Cloud computing is relatively new compared to the rest of computing, but it's a very complex topic, and I can't possibly cover everything that there is to cover in this brief amount of time. What I'm going to try to do is to give you a cocktail party slash Scientific American, the new Scientific American, not the old Scientific American, uh, sort of survey of some important issues you should know, vocabulary terms you ought to understand, concepts you ought to understand. If your boss says, hey, we want to get, get us some of that cloud computing, what should you ask for? This will give you that kind of grounding to sort of know what questions to ask and where to go next. Okay. So with that, I'm going to start out with what is cloud computing? Well, at simplest, cloud computing is a change of paradigm. Instead of delivering computing as a product, you go to the computer store, you buy a computer, you get some software, you load it on your computer, you're good to go. This is delivering computing as a service. Now there's two components to computing as a service. One is it's available to computers and devices over the internet. You don't have to go to the computer store to get it. Okay? If you have your iPhone, you can just or iPad, you can just go get the stuff. And the second part is that it's on demand, rapidly provisioned, a term that we learned from telecom, how quickly you can get it up and running. And you can deliver it with minimal provider interaction. Basically, go to a website, press a button, give me your credit card, and you're done. That's it. No talking to IT people, no nothing. Okay? So this cloud thing, what is this? It's, it's a metaphor, right? And people have been using this cloud metaphor for a long time. This is not new stuff. I'll show you a couple of examples of where clouds have actually been used in the last, say, 60 years. Um, suppose you've got my home and your home. And I want to call you. Well, it used to be somebody went to a patch panel and connected things like that, and we were directly connected. Not starting with about 1950, that stopped. Okay? If I wanted to call you, we had something called the public switch telephone network. And it was a whole network of stuff where the virtual connections were made in a cloud. And they referred to the term as a cloud. Let's fast forward. 1980s, the internet. Again, the Internet's been portrayed as a cloud. So the idea of a cloud as a metaphor for shared service infrastructure is not a new thing. This has been around for quite a while. And in fact, cloud computing is not a new concept. It's a, very, it's a relatively old concept. You can see how far back this idea goes. Here's the first one. Computation may someday be organized as a public utility. Sounds pretty modern, doesn't it? John McCarthy. AI expert, retired Stanford professor of computer science, in a speech at MIT Centennial in 1961. Early transistor computers. Okay. The next one, Dynabook, concept that was invented by this man, can be used to communicate with others through knowledge utilities of the future, such as school libraries or business information systems. Alan Kay, personal computer visionary, and the uncle of the iPad. Um, he's the one who suggested to Steve Jobs that if you just made an iPhone bigger and turned it into a tablet, you'd have a Dynabook and you'd sell a million of them. Okay. So these, these gentlemen have already seen the light. They know what it's about. So why haven't we done this before? Why is this a new thing? Well, it turns out that in any new technology, a bunch of things come together at a particular place at a particular time, and that's why it happened now, as opposed to 50 years ago or maybe 100 years from now. Right? And I want to show you what I think are the confluence of factors that went into cloud computing. 
There's three of them. The first one was commercial availability of the internet. This is early to mid 1990s. Before that, the internet was not commercial. You could not use it for commercial purposes. It was university only or academic only. The second one, adoption of World Wide Web technologies. Again, a relatively recent technology, uh, 19, late 1990s to early 2000s for ubiquitous adoption. And the final one is relatively new, consolidation of computing resources into hosted data centers. Larry Ellison's been advocating this. There's only six data centers in the whole wide world sort of idea. Um, this is the early and mid-2000s. And this final piece of the puzzle that came into place is really what made cloud computing make sense. And I'll show you why in a minute. The next topic is benefits and challenges of cloud computing, just to show you why you would ever want this thing. Well, the alternative, as I said, is, is purchasing and operating your own hardware and software. But compared to that, there are a few advantages and a few disadvantages to cloud computing. First of all, it's more affordable. Okay? No upfront investment. You don't have to go out and buy computers. You don't have to have electric cords and things like that. You can pay according to how much you use. It's very predictable. If you use it, you pay for it. If you don't use it, you don't. It's not sitting there running when you're off at of work. Um, and third, it's not supported by you, it's supported by the service providers. They have the staff that does it. Okay? That's the first one. The next one is it's more available. And what do I mean by that? You don't have to have long procurement cycles. If you're at an institution, you know how long it takes to get a computer in house. You don't have to do that. You dial, you, you punch up the internet, you give them your credit card, you push the button and you've got a computer. That's it. It's done. Um, you can do this in minutes. It's not something that takes days, weeks going through procurement. Most places will let you buy services quickly and cheaply where they won't let you buy hardware. It's the difference between capital and services. And they'll let you buy services cheaply. And there's no downtime. The, the people who run this infrastructure keep it upgraded, keep it running, and even if they need to upgrade it, you'll never see that because it'll be upgraded behind the scenes. There's no downtime. It's always there. It's more reliable. They have quality of service contracts. You know, it's like your telephone is darn reliable. It goes down sometimes, but you're really surprised when it does, which is how you know it's reliable. Um, they maintain and upgrade the service over time. You don't have to do the next upgrade and upgrade after that. So it, it'll, it'll just work. And finally, it's geographically distributed. You can have data centers sitting all over the place, and if one of the data centers fails, the other one fails over, and it just picks right up, and you'll never see the difference. It'll just keep running. So much more reliable than having a computer sitting there in the back room. And it's more scalable. This is the final one. This is important. You can deploy services as you need them. If you're Amazon and you, by and large, have uh, orders coming in at a certain rate, but in Christmas, it quadruples. Okay? So what happens? You have to go out and buy a bunch of new computers, a bunch of old new stuff, and then the rest of the year just sits around and does nothing because you're not going to get that peak load until, again, when? Next Christmas. Okay? So. Uh, a lot more scalable. Um, you can choose the service provider who best meets your needs. That's the other one of scalability. If this service provider doesn't have the capacity, go pick another service provider who does. Keep them both or get rid of one and keep the other. It doesn't matter. Mix and match. So there are some challenges, though. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about a few of these. This is an early stage market. And in any early stage market, um, there are challenges for early stage adopters. And let me just outline a few of these. There's no standards. They're emerging, but it's way too early to have anything like standards. So it's hard to change vendors. If you implement on one cloud platform, don't count on being able to take that implementation and move to another cloud platform. It isn't going to happen. You just won't. To some extent, it's vendor lock-in, but to some extent, it's just early marketness. There's changing landscape. New, new suppliers are coming into the market. Old ones are leaving the market as they find it wasn't a profitable market for them. So if you start with a vendor this week, maybe that vendor isn't going to be there next week. Okay? If they've got your data, this could be an issue. Right? They, they kind of obfuscate their terminology. And there's sort of two reasons for doing this. It's not that they're car salesmen exactly. It's that they're, they're inventing new terms. There's, there's, there's new stuff coming up, new concepts, new offerings, and they're trying to create terms for these things that they'll hope will become a standard, at least a de facto standard in the industry. But 
you know, it doesn't always, and some other term comes up for it instead, or maybe they refactor it. But, you know, sometimes they really do obfuscate the terms, and sometimes they really are greasy car salesmen. And, and what they're doing is they're trying to prevent you from carrying, comparing their offering to somebody else's offering. But again, this is a symptom of an emerging market. You'll see this all the time. So it's nothing to worry about. Just be aware of it. Okay. And pricing schemes very wildly in flux way. People are still trying to figure out how to price this stuff. And as competition comes up, guess what? The price can go down. As you get consolidation and one cloud vendor buys the other and you all of a sudden get AT&T, the price goes up. Okay. Right now, the price is on the way down. They just announced... Uh, Google just announced a drastic price drop in the Google Cloud Services because there's some competition coming in and they're trying to crush them. So you benefit this week, which is all you can hope for. Finally, not all cloud offerings are equal. Um, what, that, what that means is, you know, different quality, different combinations of services, just they're not equal. So I've talked a little bit about benefits and challenges. Now let me talk to you a little bit about the kinds of cloud services that are available um, and that you can go out and get. This is important and you're going to want to take notes because there's going to be some vocabulary introduced that if somebody asks you to know about cloud computing and help choose a vendor, this vocabulary is going to help you. If you're at a cocktail party and you need a great pickup line, this vocabulary is going to help you. <laughs> at least around here. Okay. Whatever you do, take notes. There won't be a test, but do take notes. There's three main types of cloud services, and they come in tiers. The top tier is called Software as a Service, S-A-A-S. And the capitalization is just the way it is. Write this down. And I'll tell you what these are in a minute. Um, the next one is Platform as a Service. And the final one is Infrastructure as a service, IAAS. So there's two A's in the middle, there's an S at the end, and a different initial at the beginning. And that's the difference between these. So S, P, I, in that order. Okay, what, what is software as a service? Well, software as a service is whole software applications hosted in the cloud. Okay. Um, usually designed for interactive use, but not necessarily. There's applications out there that are more or less back-end applications that users never interact with, that you never see, like databases and things like that. But most of these things are interactive. And in the library, you're actually using some of them right now, or at least early versions of it. iTunes is a cloud service that, that gives you your music on your iPhone, iPhone and iPod, content aggregation. Um, Google Apps. Uh, content collaboration, the Google Word, Google Spreadsheet, all of that other one. Um, WorldCat, Content Catalog, is a, is a cloud-based service, okay? Content Catalog. And finally, ProQuest um, Content Discovery, again, another cloud service. These are all examples of SAAS. There's a lot of other ones, sales.com, the, the, the list goes on. I'm trying to pick some library-related ones so that it sort of relates so we can see how it works. Platform as a service, the next tier down. This is a platform that some people have referred to as Cloud OS. Okay. It's, it's an entire operating system. It provides all the services that you can need, but it's the layer on top of which you build applications, and on top of which you build tools, and on top of which you build new services. Okay. So let me show you an example of a particular cloud application, in other words, a software as a service application that you and your library could build using, uh, the, Google, using the Google Cloud Platform, um, the PAS layer. You know, you can program this stuff. You, if you have IT developers, you, know, you can use Java, you can use C++. But one of the things you can do is to use a mashup editor which Google actually provides in their, in their services. It used to be standalone, it flows. And um, you can create a mashup. Now, mashup is something that you can graphically program to flow data into each other and, and basically create an application by interactively programming rather than writing code. Let me show you the example of application, a very simple one that you might imagine building. So you've got Google Maps, which is a geolocation service. And you've got your OCLC library holding service. What could you do with that? Well, 
you could create a book locator mapping application that basically mashes up a request for a book with which library holds that book and then find the library that's closest to the person making the request by using some geolocation services that are built into the thing to locate you on the internet where you're physically sitting and then put up a map that says which library is this book closest to and, and plot them out on that map. You could do this without programming today. Okay. This is an example of an end user, a nearly end user, being able to create a software as a service application that runs in the cloud on top of a platform as a service platform. The last layer is infrastructure as a service. And, and this is actually the simplest layer to get into other than going out and buying software as a service. And I'll show you why in a minute. It's essentially a whole computer sitting in the cloud ready for you to turn it on. So here's the cloud. There's a computer. It's got an operating system, Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, your choice. Uh, a desktop applications, anything you want. Virtual desktop, so you can tune into it from your computer. It looks just like a computer. Um, virtual storage, so you've got disk space to store things on that look just like your C drive. And you've got a virtual network that allows you to connect to it and allows it to connect out to the network as though it were a standalone computer with its own network. Why is this a good thing? Well, it means if you have a traditional uh, uh, application or traditional application that you want to uh, not store on your own premises, but you want to make available in the cloud because you don't want to go off and buy a computer, this is a great way to take your computer, dump it up to the network, and you've got it. Some people run virtual machines on their own laptops or desktops. If you're a Mac user, you run uh, VMware or, or one of the other ones uh, to, to get a Windows application. Well, just instead of running it on your own computer, now you're running it up in the cloud. And that's all it is. There's a couple examples I'll give you. Um, these are products. You could write these down. These are actually products you could go out and buy that does this. Um, Amazon has one. Google has them too, but I'll just use Amazon. They have something called Elastic Cloud Computing, EC2. You should write this down. It's, it's another vocabulary term. And what it is, is it gives you a whole virtual machine in the cloud. And then you add to that Amazon Simple Storage Service, S3, which is virtual storage. You could use it together with the virtual machine, but actually you can write applications that use it independently of that. There's a whole programming interface for it as well. Another example, VMware has one. VMware is vCloud Express, virtual machine, it's a network file system, there's your virtual storage, and you're ready to go. The difference between VMware and Amazon is Amazon hosted on their site and VMware you hosted on yours. So, these are some of the vendors. Amazon, market leader by a long shot. Google, at Microsoft Azure has an offering. Rackspace has them. Uh, GoGrid, you can just sort of see it like that. There's a link down at the bottom if you go download the presentation. This is off of a Zendos uh, report from 2010. A few things have changed, but there's a URL. You can actually go get the report. Take a look at it. So we've talked a little bit about cloud services and the three types of cloud services. Okay. Um, now let's talk about cloud deployment. The first kind of cloud deployment you should know about is the public cloud. It's the one most people know about. The public cloud is somebody else out there has a service. They have all the computers sitting in the back room. This is how Amazon got started. Remember I talked about the order processing system and they had to buy more computing than they possibly needed because of Christmas time? Well, they had another 11 months they needed to sitting. These computers were just sitting around. So they said, hmm, maybe we could get into the cloud computing business. And so this is what for cloud computing they helped pioneer it. Um, they said, well, let's just make all of our excess capacity available to people whenever we're not using it. They can buy it, we'll make services available, and we're running on the same platform that they are. Benefits, obviously. Immediate availability. Simple to set up. Unlimited resources. Okay, as much, as much space as you possibly need. But there's some downsides too, or at least some concerns. There's privacy of sensitive data. This data is not yours. I mean, it's not sitting on your place. You're accessing it over a network. People could get at it. This has got to be a concern. Physical custody. If you ever wanted to take custody of these three terabytes or six terabytes or however much data you're generating, how do you do it? And finally, the external cost. Um, the, the idea that 
you have to pay money outside of your organization is a different idea than you pay money to a different group inside your organization for many organizations. So you have to think about internal costs versus external costs. Here, you're paying an external cost. And in some organizations, that's bad. Or at least it's more difficult. So the second model of cloud computing, or the way of deploying cloud computing, is called a private cloud. And, and it's kind of obvious what this means. You go build a data center inside your own building. Um, you provision the computers. Um, you set everything up. And you're ready to go. Or you could buy hosting services that's just bare, bare bones hosting services from some place, like places down in San Jose who have the power fail circuitry that keeps the generators going. Um, but it, whichever way you do it, it obviously answers a lot of the problems. You control sensitive data. You maintain physical custody of the data, and the cost stays in the organization. But there are concerns. You have to set up a data center or at least you have to hire a data center to do this for you. Um, there is a set of cost and maintenance involved, and it has limited scalability, at least overall in your organization. If you won't see limited scalability, you could get as much as you want, but that's a little bit less available for other people who may come along later. So you have to plan for enough capacity if you're doing this. There's no free lunch. Well, actually, that's not quite true. There is. The third model is called hybrid. And hybrid is sort of the closest you'll ever come to free lunch. Basically what it does is it combines the public and the private cloud based on the needs of the organization. So you can see the little picture I have there to give you an idea. There's a private cloud platform and a public cloud platform. And you put a bridge between the two, and all of a sudden you've got a hybrid cloud. It's kind of like your hybrid cars. It can run on gas. It can run on electricity. It can run less far on electricity, which means a, a, a private cloud because you have less capacity. You have a bigger gas tank, so that means that the public cloud has, has more scalability than your private cloud does, but you can keep going back and forth just like you do with a hybrid car. So private cloud for sensitive data. Um, draw on the public cloud for peak load. Don't do it when it isn't. Um, balance your costs because public cloud costs something, whereas the private cloud maybe costs less. And you get to work with multiple best-of-breed vendors. So you sort of can have it all. So we've talked about cloud services, how you deploy the cloud services. But there's a big concern that a lot of people have, and it's justified. And I'm going to talk about this more than rather than focusing on any other one, because I think this is the most important thing for you to know about. Cost and all that, you can look it up. It's constantly changing. But security is forever. So let's talk about security in the cloud. Security in the cloud is as big a challenge as security if you have the computer on your own premises. No doubt about it. If you're running a big data operation, if you've got a lot of data that matters a lot to you, security has got to be important no matter what you do. This is another place where there's no free lunch. You have to worry about it you as an end user. Okay. I don't know how many of you have been following this one, but here's a little item um, that, sh that got my attention. Uh, happened in May. Some hacker threw a couple pennies at Amazon, got an account, and went and hacked Sony's PlayStation uh, network, attacked it from one of these virtual machines running in the cloud. Perfectly legitimate login, everything else like that, but he just uses a launching platform for attacking Sony's PlayStation network. It led to the second biggest online breach in US history. 100 million accounts down for months. You may not have noticed it, but if you have kids, they sure as heck did. Okay. And you probably noticed it too, because if they're not happy, you're not happy. OK, cloud security. You've got to have proactive response to cloud security. You just do. And it starts with having a data security plan. Everything we need to tell you isn't unique to cloud. It's unique to computing in general, if you're running any kind of commercial computing system. You have to have a security plan. You have to have it in writing. What kind of contingencies do you want to protect against? How are you going to protect against them? And what are you going to do if things go wrong? Okay. You're not going to catch everything, but you ought to have at least a script for what you can anticipate and write it down. That's a data plan. You need to talk to your cloud security cloud vendors and find out what their security policies are. Talk to Amazon. 
ask them what they've done to remediate this kind of problem to prevent people from, from getting onto this platform and doing this kind of thing again. You, they owe you an answer, and they owe you an answer in writing if you're a customer who's going to rent space. You need to implement adequate security measures to answer the data security plan. Okay? It doesn't have to be bulletproof if, if bulletproof isn't required, but you have to implement measures that answer the issues that are brought up in the data security plan, period. You need to audit your implementation. What does that mean? You need to keep monitoring what's going on to make sure nobody's breaking in. Okay? They, it may be months. You don't know. Find out whether or not everything is going as you expected and whether you're getting attacks against your system and whatever. And finally, you need to stay abreast of security threats. Um, and if you find new security threats, what do you do? Hide? No. You go back to your data security plan. You add a section to your data security plan that says, what do I do about this new threat? And you go back through and say, OK, what is the vendor doing? What's adequate security measures? And you keep cycling around again and again. So that's, that's basically what you have to do to make the cloud secure if you're setting up a cloud-based computing system. Why, why do you have to pay attention to the cloud in particular? It's because the cloud is a much more powerful platform than you could ever possibly set up on your own, and it can do a lot more damage. Somebody might break into your system and wipe out the National Security Agency, and guess who's going to show up on your doorstep? Okay, it's going to be tough. Um, I see five security trends in 2012 that I want to share with you. First is the threat from mobile devices. What do I mean by that? Well, we've got iPads sitting around here. We've got iPhones. We've got all kinds of smartphones and cellular device and devices that are connecting to the web. They're pulling data off. The devices get lost. Okay? All of a sudden, you've got a leak that didn't come through your cloud. It came through your edge devices. So you need to figure out what you're going to do about that. Better access control and identity management. You know, right now our access control identity management infrastructure just really sucks. Um, people can spoof email, just a whole bunch of things like that. There's, it's, it's really lame. It was designed for a time where people, there weren't any hackers of the kind that we know about now that are really going to break in and do bad things. So there are, people are working on much better infrastructures for this, and it's going to come to the cloud very, very soon. Regulatory compliance. If you're a pharma company, you know about regulatory compliance, but businesses have regulatory compliance issues too. Um, you need to be aware of what regulatory compliance issues um, are out there, and platform vendors are doing a lot better job providing you the tools you're going to need to implement regulatory compliance. Risk of multiple public cloud tenants. What's that mean? Well, you're living in an apartment building when you're living in, in a public cloud, right? You've got an apartment, and the next person has an apartment. It looks like it's all yours, and it looks like it's all theirs. But actually, there's a hallway and shared spaces and stairways where you can get mugged and a bunch of stuff like that. Well, you know, anybody who can break into your computer from an external computer can break into your computer even faster by by being next door, exactly. <laughs> so there's going to be viruses that are going to wipe through cloud implementations much more easily then there are viruses that are going to wipe through a network. It's just going to happen. Um, there's risks. And finally, the emergence of cloud standards and certifications. Remember I said there are no standards right now. There are some de facto standards. For instance, Amazon EC2, S3 are, are kind of de facto standards only in the sense that four or five other vendors have done clean room implementations of them. And they're actually selling them off. They're not quite compatible, and the problem right now is there's no way to say what compatible means, okay, even for these de facto ones. I see the standards emerging, the certifications of EC2 and S3 compliance coming up in 2012. Customers are going to insist on it. You say you've got an S3 implementation, that has to mean something. So I've talked about services, deployment, security. What I want to close on is two use cases of cloud computing in libraries and digital curation. These are not current because current applications are sort of thin on the ground right now. It's just getting started. But I want to give you an idea of what could be in a year or two years, um, how I see things playing out. Um, and, and I'll do f the first one related to um, libraries. There's a problem. Libraries are getting more and more IT heavy. 
and they're having to pay more and more money for IT. So the obvious thing is to do what? Go to the cloud, of course. Um, you know, the problem right now is that all of the well-known library automation systems came out in the client-server era. They're not designed to be run as services. They're just not. They're mon big monolithic things that can't be mixed and matched like these mashups can be mixed and matched. It just doesn't happen. It's really difficult to integrate these kind of things and in-house applications, which are also monolithic, um, from multiple vendors. You just can't do it. And fewer, off, fewer vendors offer fully integrated end-to-end -end solutions where you can get away with not doing this kind of integration. So the solution is a cloud-based library service platform, a brand new piece that doesn't exist right now. Rather than implementing your applications, your library applications, on just bare metal on an infrastructure level, what you need is a, a service level that's just, just slightly above the uh, uh, platform as a service layer that provides a set of services on top of which everybody can build common library applications and services that interoperate. Okay? So you'll see library-specific service modules coming up that multiple vendors will provide that are interoperable and compatible and are designed to be woven together in ways that you want them woven together. And that's what the library service platform looks like. It's a combination. Um, it's a combination of public clouds, with commercial library services like catalogs, discovery services, cataloging, vendor interfaces. Private clouds running in your own facilities, institutional repositories, applications, patron services, business logic like the mashups I showed you that, that put it all together. And it all comes together as a hybrid library platform that library IT, librarians and patrons, can all work with together. And it could well be that if this is all running in cloud-based services, that you can draw on library IT experts that aren't even in your shop. Okay. Something to consider. Because having IT people on staff is expensive, and having a lot of them on staff is really expensive. Okay. Here are a couple of emerging library cloud solutions. And I want to thank Helen Josephine from the Engineering Library at Stanford for sending me um, a very nice article that called these out. And I put the URL to that article uh, down at the bottom. And, and again, you can download this presentation, um, and you'll get the URL for that, and you can go get it. Um, these, these are ones that are just coming out. You can see some of them have announced it, like uh, Serial Solutions Web Scale Management Solution. They're starting. There are no interoperability standards yet, but people are still are trying to build these kind of modules now. At least. Let's go on to the second use case and final one. The United States government has started requiring data management plans for all research proposals. It's just amazing how people are scrambling around trying to figure out what they mean by a data management plan, and it's pretty detailed. Okay. And you can't get any money from the government without it. So. The problem right now is that the common practice, at least at universities, and I'm sure at other places too, is to stick a desktop onto your computer if you're the researcher, and Bob's your uncle. There's your data management plan. It's on my desktop under my computer. Well, the problem is that nobody knows it's there. They don't know where it's at. And even if they knew where it's at and they could get to it, you know, it's hard for other people to get at, and most people couldn't figure out what's on your disk, even if they could get, could get to it. There's not even any descriptive metadata. And finally, worst of all, computers can go away when the researchers leave. It happens all the time. And your data's gone. It's no longer there. And this is the kind of thing that National Science Foundation, DARPA, and others are really worried about and why they want this kind of plan. Putting together this kind of plan and implementing it on a researcher-by-researcher -researcher basis is really expensive and you're not going to get consistent results. If you're a Stanford University, you don't want each research group or each researcher trying to figure out what that means and putting something together, even if they go to the cloud, which they're starting to think about now. Ad hoc solutions are not acceptable. What you need is a cloud-based R&D data curation system. This doesn't exist yet, and I've been thinking about this one for a long, long time, and I think it's time this thing actually gets built, or at least prototyped somewhere, maybe at Stanford, who knows. Um, you've got scientists there, and there's their desktop computers sitting under their desks, maybe on their desks. And the first thing you need to do is have your IT people come in, jack up those computers, and haul them out of their office. 
Okay? No more computers in your office. You can have an iPad in your office. You can have a computer with no disk in your office. But you can't have a computer that has data in your office. You just can't. So what do you do instead? Well, infrastructure as a service comes to the rescue. You stick those PCs in virtual machines sitting in the cloud that look just like the machines. They're a spit and image of that machine. And it works exactly the like. They come in the next morning. They log onto the terminal. They dial up this instance. And they're right back where they started from as clean as a whistle. Just works. That's not good enough. I mean, that 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 at least gets it out of the out of the de under the desktop with where the dust bunnies gather, and it it uh, gets it up to a place where it can be permanently maintained, even if the researcher goes away, assuming you can do it. But you need to go a step further. What you need is to create two interfaces in the cloud. These are these are services that you're going to create in the cloud around these virtual machine instances. One is a metadata database for storing common metadata among those virtual machine instances. It's not just for each one. It's a pool. The next thing is a discovery interface. If you want other people to get at that data, you have to provide interfaces that allow them to get at that data cleanly and discover that that data is there. And finally, you need a curation interface that allows um, curation activity to go on across all of those computers without disturbing the scientists and what they're up to, behind the scenes curation. Scientists won't do it. They don't want to do it. They can help with the higher level stuff, but the basic curation stuff, they don't even want to be involved with. So what you do instead is you take a data curator and you build a web based uh, application as a service interface, uh, data curation workbench, that allows the curator to go into the curation interface and start doing curation, building metadata, doing a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, there's, there's even forensic software. I, I saw some forensic software in use at Stanford in one of the uh, library groups that gets hard drives in. And it's the same one that the police use when they try to isolate content on a disk. It turns out you can buy this for 800 bucks. And what you can do is to go through and catalog everything that's on the computer by data type, dates created, all kinds of stu crazy stuff. And it's ideal for a first cut pass at creating basic physical metadata for what's on the computer. You can go back later and create structured metadata that's domain specific, but the basic metadata will be there if you just use this police forensic software that you can buy for $800. That's got to be part of the data, data curation workbench. So those are two scenarios that I see as potentials for over the next couple of years for using cloud computing in both libraries and digital curation. So we've talked about you know, what is cloud computing, benefits, services, deployment, security, and some use cases. And I think you've got a fairly good grounding now about what cloud computing is all about, the kind of things it's good for, and some of the issues you need to look out for um, as you start investigating cloud solutions for your own organizations. Um, if you want to ask more questions, if we don't get to it at the end of this session, or you think of something next week, send me mail. There's my email address. If you could put, um, you know, something like cloud computing webinar in the message line, my emailer can classify it correctly and do the right thing for me, and I'll find it a lot more quickly. I get thousands of email messages a week, so uh, give me, help me out. Help me to answer your questions by doing that. And and with that, my final thought is thank you. Okay, so the, are there are there questions from so questions may be coming in from the web, and they may also be coming in through uh, uh, the audience here. Hi, Judy. That's great. So, do you know, have you had, talked to them about how they built their application? Is it really a set of what web services? of cloud services that can be uh, uh, assembled, or is it, a, is it a single integrated application? Single integrated application. Yeah. So um, I think, Judith, you're talking about InMagic um, as being in your, in going into your library and that you're quite happy with that. And I think I was asking whether it was a, actually a cloud-based solution or it was a uh, web service, web service client server-based application. Cloud. Okay. Do you know what cloud platform they're on? Okay. I'd like to know. 
I'm starting. I'm starting to track library applications that are and services that are actually cloud-based. So if you could send those to me, if you know about them, I'd love to hear it. Uh, back here, please. Yes, Micro, take the microphone. So the question is: Are there any government-sponsored cloud initiatives? There, there actually are a few. Um, there's a lot of research going on that's being funded, obviously, in cloud computing. The, the one that I'm aware of most is NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technologies, actually has a very detailed manifesto on it. I didn't put the URL in this presentation, but if you look up NIST and cloud, they, they provide some very exact definitions uh, that they've come up with for what it means to be cloud, for, for formal definitions for these service layers that I've talked about. They're basically trying to codify in some way the practice that's come up and, and put it out as a document. And there is a comprehensive document from NIST um, on that subject. So that's what I'm most aware of. No implementations. There's, I mean, the problem right now is um, it, it's in commercial implementation. So there's no real reason for the government to come up with one. The government's more in the mood to purchase and license stuff than they are to actually build new stuff unless they have something to add. The National Security Agency is very well likely doing some stuff with cloud that won't see the light of day ever. Um, and, and maybe some other agencies are too, but to the best of my knowledge, they're, what they're trying to do is more foster uh, the public sector and, and academics to do research and to come up with products that they can buy. Uh, I have one coming here first. Two questions coming in on the web. Hmm. I can't point you to specific business cases. I can make a more I can make a general business case for it. If your if your library is part of a larger organization that's already investing in IT infrastructure internally, which is like a lot of organizations do. Hewlett Packard does, Oracle does, uh, Gilead does. They have all have IT inf infrastructure. Then it's likely that they're looking at cloud services right now, especially hybrid models, uh, to, because it's the the internal ones. They've already paid the capital cost. If they can just distribute that computing resources more uniformly across the company on an on-demand basis then they're way ahead in terms of future IT purchases, especially department-level IT purchases. So it's likely that your IT department is already looking at this. So now the question is, find out who's looking at this in your IT department and start talking with them about how the library can be part of that cloud solution, what kinds of services they're already investing in, and make them aware of the kind of services that you think you need that would be in addition to the ones they're doing that and, and make a business case for why those additional services would that would benefit the entire organization. Okay. Are, can they can they build new applications out of your service plus some ones that they're already investing in, like that mashup that I showed you? Uh, maybe they didn't have Google Maps, but now they will. Who knows? But I think that that's really the business case for doing it. Is large organizations already have IT infrastructure? I'm I'm having informal discussions with with people in the IT group at Stanford. Uh, about what they're doing with cloud computing services. And it's in the evaluation stage right now, quite frankly. They have data centers. They're evaluating it. They know they want to go that direction. Uh, the library, to my knowledge, library system, to my knowledge, hasn't been part of that discussion, although uh, the group that's doing this is, is reports to the same person that some of the library uh, reports to. So I could see it happening. And the libraries ought to get more involved. Yes. The question is, how do, you, how do you handle the case where you have organizations that have different levels of security, and each one of those organizations may be implementing a cloud, and how do you get those clouds together, or to what extent can you get those clouds together, or should you? And, and one model I didn't talk about that's related to the hybrid model is called a community model. And a community model basically has a bunch of disparate clouds that could be private, and different multiple organizations can share different parts of the cloud. You might build up a cloud for a particular cross-functional role. And some of these clouds um, are starting to build bridges across each other that implement what are called security rings. Um, that means that you have need-to-know implementations. Certain people have access to certain levels of those. Security rings are very common in security 
uh, apparatus and, and security organizations as well as things like operating systems and things like that. Level zero is always the most secure and it goes out from there. Um, you can actually start building these bridges between uh, clouds and they're starting to call this intercloud. In fact, Vint Cerf um, just recently started talking about the intercloud as a formal service layer very much like he's been talking about the internet as a way of bridging multiple disparate network implementations that provides you these access controls and limits and, and provides all the bridging technology for you in a more standard rather than ad hoc way. So yeah, you should. Um, and the question now is, are, are you game enough to essentially define what the bridges are now before formal infrastructure like Vince Cerf has been talking about uh, become available? If Sometimes the need for the bridging is very simple, and you can do it by copy in, copy out kind of thing uh, through through a essentially a demilitarized zone. That's what they're called, uh, DMZs, um, and and you can copy data out of a secure ring into a DMZ after it's been authorized by appropriate security people, and then you can copy it into out of that DMZ into a less secure zone, um, and that's possible. So there are, there are well-known ways of doing this. So I think it's worthwhile exploring to see if it's possible because it may be dead simple. Solving the general problem is hard. Solving specific problems may be very easy. You shouldn't let that stop you. Question back here. Yeah. Right. So or time shares. So the, 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 the question here is uh, basically, um, how is this different from timeshare back in the 70s? You know, do we have dumb terminals and timeshare systems versus dumb, you know, smart terminals and cloud? Is that, is, are we back around, coming around again? Is this a spiral rather than a circle maybe? A little bit. The main thing about the cloud isn't that it's off there in the back room somewhere. The big thing about the cloud is you have a very large capacity uh, sink, almost an infinite capacity sink of stuff, and there's no sharing, okay? you have access to as much services as you want to buy as granular as you want to. Timeshare to some degree had that. You had disk quotas and, and CPU times and things like that, but it was a pretty coarse kind of thing. They tried to create a, a, a box around you, but it wasn't really good. You, you had your little bit of time, then they had their little bit of time. So it's, it's, it's a different beast altogether. It has some same characteristics, but it's really, really different. Yeah. So the question here is, you know, you've you've you're really adding to the cost. You need to, now you need a professional curator in this case study too that I came up with. Um, if you're doing digital curation, the scientist is gonna is is there, and now you have a curator as well. Well, the problem is, scientists don't know anything about curation. They don't want to know anything about curation. Is a scientist going to be involved? Yeah, they are. The the physical metadata for the descriptive metadata that's coming up for that data. The scientist really doesn't care about that, and a lot of that's automatable. Working with domain expertise um, and, and interviewing the scientist in their groups about what's the real structure, what's the meaning of this, the scientist is absolutely going to be involved. But again, does the scientist want to commit all of that stuff to ontologies, to come up with taxonomies and things like that? No. The scientist doesn't have any skills at doing that. And if you rely on the scientist to get it done, they won't because it's not their job and they're not skilled at doing it. Okay? That's where professional taxonomists go. The reason this workbench works out so great is that you can have one taxonomist rather than one per group. You can have a group of taxonomists and, and digital curators as a pool who go around a whole group of scientists across there and work on the different ones. But there's something even more important than that. If you have a bunch of people doing similar things at, at an organization, it's like librarians. They see all of the inflow of questions that are coming in an organization. They're sort of the bards of the organization, if you will. What you're going to get is they're going to see similarities. They're going to start making connections. They're going to come up with common ontologies for things. They'll come up with, with overlapping taxonomies that fit together. A lot of things will happen as a result of them seeing the deal flow, if you will, across a whole organization that you won't get if you have an embedded taxonomist sitting in an individual group. So no, the scientist has got to be part of this for the, for the uh, uh, domain-specific descriptive stuff, but they don't need to be part of it for the grunt stuff that these people can do. Sure. 
Sure. I mean, if, if, if you have a way that scientists can organize their data for presentation and for preservation, and you get them in the habit of recording data in that way, then you're going to be a lot better off than if, if it's just raw data and all of a sudden you're an archaeologist coming in there with these dead stones and dead bones, okay, and trying to figure out what the culture looked like. Of course, you're a lot further ahead, and I applaud that. I think that's right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, the comment the comment Gene is making is that there won't be a cost savings, but there's going to be a qualitative difference in the results as a result of having information professionals involved. And I, I agree. Um, the the thing is that um, the NSF right now has started asking for data curation plans that I that I think about as version zero data curation plans, even though they want. A frightening looking form filled out. It's not actually frightening if you look at what you have to do to do it. It's just a frightening form. Okay, that's all it is. Well, they don't actually know what they want. They sort of do, but they actually don't. So they don't want to cast it in concrete. They're going to have relatively few requirements, and it's going to evolve. It'll start becoming more sophisticated. So as it starts becoming more sophisticated, the, result, the advantage of having professional taxonomists in a workbench situation like this is that you can respond to it because you're already set up to do it. If you all of a sudden hit this threshold where the scientists can't do it themselves and you have to try to set that up, now you're in triage. So it's better to do this right. Somebody ought to build this, this data curation workbench, at least a, a prototype of it, just to demonstrate what it can do and to get an idea of the benefits and, and how you use such a thing. Right. So this, this question goes towards software as a service and, and the, the, the ability of software as a service to scale with the number of users and the number of applications. Is, is the network fast enough? Is there enough compute capacity? Well, you know, Microsoft has Office 360. Google has the Google Office applications. The thing that you have to remember is that there's two ways, and you could, you've learned this now from the presentation, uh, to do uh, at least the Microsoft Office 360. There's a, there's a hosted software as a service, that is to say a public software as a service infrastructure, and you can bet that Microsoft, if they're going to be successful at cloud-based applications, has set up enough scalable resources that they're going to be able to handle the number of customers. They've, they've been monitoring how people use desktop applications for a long, long time. It's not that the applications are necessarily, um, you know, key keyboard command through keyboard command going to that. They put some local stuff and some local application parts loaded so that actually the application is distributed from a user interface processor and presentation processor to the back end stuff. So they can they can put some smarts on the client desktop that will still make it you know fast enough. But the, the, the secret here is that if you build this on top of a cloud services platform, this is cloud OS, um, you've got to have enough capacity to handle the users. And what you're doing is you're, you're counting on the fact that you can buy additional capacity on demand. And that's really the whole reason you have to believe that the cloud works. Is the bandwidth fast, you know, network bandwidth fast enough? Well, it depends. Um, if you're taking a wide area network, like you're going to Microsoft's offices or wherever and there's a single place, you know, hard to say. There's a lot of hops and a lot of jumps and a lot of latency. So you press the key A in 30 seconds letter, the A appears on your screen. Yeah, I mean, it's, it could be a problem. They have data centers all over the place, and they try to make things not physically close, but close in terms of network uh, closeness, you know, like how many hops it is. So they have to cite things, or it just doesn't work. The second is Office 360 can be hosted in a private cloud at, on the company's site. So if you're HP, you can license Office 360, put it in your data center, and let it work for your, your company. And, and really, that combination of public cloud with essentially infinite capacity well-placed uh, hosting facilities where things are, pr are close in a network sense of close, plus the ability to do hybrid clouds of public and private clouds hosting these applications is what really will make this work. If it doesn't work, the cloud's going to fail as an application platform, just plain and simple. But so far, um, you know, it's it succeeded. There, we won't, we'll know when the rollout happens. It's just now starting to roll out. So we just can't tell. You know, the question is, will it work for your library? Forget, forget about Microsoft Office. You know, you've got a bunch of students. If you're at a university, you've got a bunch of, of, of important executives if you're at a corporation. Um, is it going to work for them? 
again, it depends, and you have to be smart about how you deploy those services. All right, I think I've run way over time. Thank you very much for your questions, and please mail me if you have any others.